97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four with Jeff Mosier, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. I love coaching this football team. I love coaching those players in there. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and of course it's brought to you by PlaySugarHouse.com. Sign up now. They'll match your first deposit up to $250. The Inside the Birds podcast drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 6 a.m., including today with Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan. Mosher's in the house on a Friday edition, and he, like all guests, appear via the Boardwalk Honda hotline. And don't forget the Inside the Birds pregame show Sunday at 10 as they get re- get you ready for the Eagles and the Cardinals. What's going on, Mosh? How you guys doing? All is well, man. Uh, we're getting ready for obviously. Look, this is pro- this could be the last meaningful football game of the season. I mean, Eagles lose, Washington wins. Uh, they are officially eliminated. But you know, a win here and a Washington loss, you got to think that man. This really starts to get interesting. Yeah, you know, uh, you, you would. I mean, yeah, sometimes three games can feel like an eternity. So there's a there's definitely a lot of football left to play. But you certainly start to close. You can close the gap. If uh, the Eagles win, Washington loses. I think the Giants have a difficult game against the uh, Browns, and they're a little bit beat up as well. So uh, you can basically throw the NFC East uh, outside of Dallas in a blender <laughs> if if the things fall in place where the Eagles win and, and those teams lose. You really could, and uh, obviously, like most weeks, most the Eagles have a ton of drama around this team, and this one goes, you know, uh, this whole thing with Orlovsky's comments about Wentz, don't, don't you find that because they come from Orlovsky that they're a lot more damning to Wentz than they would be if it was just a regular insider? If you mean by public perception would think that Carson is sending messages through Orlovsky as a mouthpiece? Yeah, I think so. Um, betrayed was an interesting choice of words. Uh, I think that's what he said, right? That they right. He, he said that Carson he felt feels- he felt uh, a lot of people feel that Wentz feels betrayed by the organization, essentially, and the only person that he can trust in the league is Frank Reich. I mean, to hear that, it's like, well, where would Orlovsky get that from? Uh, I don't know. The Frank Reich fascination is is perplexing to me. I mean, I do understand that Carson played his best football with Reich as the offensive coordinator and John Filippo as the quarterback's coach. And and norm, ordinarily for a quarterback, you have much more of an association with your quarterback's coach. That's your position coach. That's the guy you're in the classroom with. And I'm not trying to say that there's no relationship between uh, the offensive coordinator. Certainly there was, and Frank Reich was a, a calming presence. And I'm sure, I'm sure he helped Carson Wentz. But I feel like we're getting to the point where public sentiment is that Carson Wentz can't survive and play good football in the league if he's not coached by anybody other than Frank Reich. And if if there's even a degree of truth to that, well, that's more of Carson's issue than the Eagles or anybody else's. Exactly. And it's like, you know, did he feel betrayed last year when Frank Reich wasn't here? Was it is it only because they benched him? Well, the benching's his own doing. He he didn't play very well. So that's why I feel that was a pretty strong term to use, especially if he felt betrayed within the last week or so. Yeah, I, I don't. That's what I would wonder. Where does the betrayal come in here? Uh, was Carson surprised that he was benched? I mean, he shouldn't have been. Does he feel betrayed by the organization drafting Jalen Hurts and not doing more? At, offensive line and wide receiver there's some validity to that but um that's it's not just the quarterback who suffers it's the entire team uh, does he feel betrayed by the coaches who were fired last year because press taylor is the guy that coaches him mostly and 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 has a good relationship with him and he was promoted in this offseason press taylor so you I, I would just need a clearer definition and and the report by the way is very strange it's those close to carson believe that Carson feels betrayed? Does that mean that we're just having two levels of sources who are reading tea leaves instead of giving actual concrete information? So I I just, I I really don't know how much to put into it, nor do I know how much of that really matters at this point. Well, I mean, I guess 
if it's coming from, you know, there's built up animosity between Wentz and the Eagles. And if that's coming from the Eagles side, is that, I mean, if that's coming from the Wentz side, which if it gets to Orlovsky, you would think that it's coming from the Wentz side. Is that them putting the first sprinkles of we want out of here? Possibly, you know, and and we'll see as the off season develops. It's, it's, it's possible. Um, but you know what? I would just say this, and, and it really isn't, it doesn't address what you're asking, but if Carson Wentz wants to get his way out of Philly and go to a different team, it's not going to change the fact that he's got to rebuild himself and he's got to be receptive to what's trying to be coached to him and he's got to be coached hard. And um, even when he was playing well, the mechanics and the overstriding and, uh, you know, the not wanting to check it down, those, those have been issues in the past. So even when he – you know, plays well, he's able to compensate for them. But some other coach is going to try to hammer that out of him the same way. Yeah, and, and then I guess, I mean, just to flip it around real quick, Mosh, if it did, in fact, come from the Eagles side of things, which I, I find hard to believe, like, hey, we want you to put out there that there's animosity. <laughs> I just don't see how that's the case. But if that, if they're putting that out there, that doesn't help. So this has to come from the e- – that's what I'm saying. It has to come from the – it doesn't make any sense for the Eagles to put that out, right? I mean, unless you have a way that this makes sense for the Eagles to get this out there. Uh, yeah, I, I can't figure that one out. I can't see how it would be beneficial to the Eagles, uh, who have already taken their fair share of, of hits themselves and backlash themselves for what's happened to Carson Wentz. It's not like the entire public has only blamed Carson Wentz. I mean, why would the Eagles – you know, come out with a self-own, <laughs> basically, when they've already been under the gun for how they've, uh, you know, their inability to to get him out of his bad habits, to coach him hard enough, and to put the right type of talent around him. Yeah, I, 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 to me, that just seemed to be an out of right field thing to to bring up that there's this build up, and, and the whole fact that you know the only person in the league he trusts is Frank Reich. I mean. Did he not trust anybody last year when he was carrying this team to the playoffs all by himself? Like, I don't know. It just doesn't add up to me. It just seems to add more of a strange nature to an already strange situation and relationship here. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're the Colts, though, you're you're trying to basically call up the Eagles in the offseason and see if you can get Carson for a sixth at this point, right? I mean, you're going to capitalize on that as much as you can try. Right. Yeah, all the reports, it's just, it's mind blowing to hear, you know, what only Frank Reich, as if anybody else can't get the job done with this quarterback. It's just ridiculous. But let's dive into the action a little bit. So, my biggest concern looking at this matchup on Sunday is the defense. They are just extremely banged up. And I want to ask you, how do you think Jim Schwartz should play this? I think Jim should probably play, um, not that I'm, you know, some expert at telling Jim what to do, but I'm thinking because of all the injuries that we're expecting here in the secondary, that it's probably going to be his best advantage to play more zone this week uh, instead of man. I believe they played a lot more zone against uh, the, the the Saints last week. If you don't have Darius Slay and you don't have a true shutdown corner to cover to uh, to trail with Hopkins, and you know you won't have Avante Maddox, and you know you're probably moving Jalen Mills out to one corner so you're a little, and you don't have McLeod so you're you're on backups basically at both safety positions and and two corner positions it's probably not going to be very easy to you know blitz left and right and play a lot of man defense I think you're gonna have to play zone uh, and hope your front four gets to Kyler Murray you, you can still do that and maybe blitz a, a linebacker I, I would you know I'm in favor of kind of the idea of trying to make a a quarterback left-handed where you, you blitz him from one side and force him to his left uh, I think that would be a good idea with Kyler Murray or at least funnel your pressure that way. But otherwise, <laughs> I, it's not like Jim's got a whole bag of tricks of things he can do with such a depleted back end. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that maybe you throw a little QB spy on him? And who, who would that be? You know, it's not like you that, got all these. A great question. Yeah, who would it be? Yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> By the way, speaking I, of who would it be, and I know this wouldn't be the guy, but has anybody heard or seen from Nate Geary at all? Well, yes, uh, we heard from Nate Gary from via Lane Johnson. They they when the Eagles were playing the Packers in Green Bay, I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, Lane Johnson tweeted out a picture of himself and Gary side by side in their 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 surgical beds. They had both underwent procedures out in Green Bay, where Doctor Watkins, I believe, is his name. He, he's uh, he does a lot of the uh, ankle and foot uh, surgeries in the NFL. Gotcha. So uh, even though the Eagles not really 
mentioning anything or saying it, I think that picture was worth uh, enough words there to know that uh, Gary also went underwent a procedure that weekend and will probably not return this year. Thinking of some of these cornerbacks, what happened with Roby Coleman? You know, a lot of people thought that this guy was the steal of the free agency and all, and do you think that this is a product of Jim Schwartz? Because there's a lot of corners that don't seem to play well here, and then they leave and they play well elsewhere, whereas this the opposite of that. I mean, he he is having a tough go at it. He is, you know, I always say, and I thought it was a good value signing because it was a one-year deal, it wasn't a lot of money, but whenever a guy is out on the free agent market, it's for a reason, you know. Sometimes it's financial. A guy gets cut. He's a good player, but um, the team can't afford it because of salary cap issues. And certainly with the Rams, you know, they are paying a lot of guys. So that could have been it. But Nikel's played. He was with the Saints before the Rams. So that's three teams in three years will tell you something. And I, I still thought it was a good signing. He was really good at getting his hands on the football not necessarily from an interception standpoint, but from a pass breakup standpoint, one of the better slot corners in the league the last few years, but obviously just not ha- has not had that magic this year. Uh, it's probably part of the moving parts defense that has, you've seen a lot. And there, there were a couple two games out there where Nikel had to play outside corner and my God, he's only what five, eight, five, seven. So um, certainly not meant for the outside and that didn't help him any, but I agree. I don't think he's been, uh, he has not come as advertised. I don't know if that's on Jim or just a, a player who's declining. I sense that Avante Maddox will be your your slot corner next year and that the Eagles will have to do a better job of uh, upgrading on the outsides. Uh, Jeff Mosher, Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Um, over at Inside the Birds, uh, the podcast, you guys talked about Jalen Hurts in his second go-around. How will this be different from the first one in terms of you know, there's film on him now. I thought the second half was different than the first half last week, uh, that once <laughs> Dennis Allen got a little half and figured out some things, that the Eagles' offense had a little bit different look in the second half uh, from New Orleans than they got in the first half. So uh, Doug Peterson's going to have to dial up something different this week. Can't go back to the same drawing board here. Yeah, my concern for Jalen is that he's facing a totally different style of defense, and the Saints have a very good defense. Or you know, they're almost like a really smart, really tough defense. Guys like uh, you know Cameron Jordan and Malcolm Jenkins and uh, um, Hend- Hendrickson on the other side. But what the what the Cardinals are is they're a multiple front defense. They're they're kind of a base three four, but they will blitz six, seven, eight guys. The Saints don't do that. The Saints are more about, we'll send a little pressure, but we're really going to, you know, play our keys and be disciplined. But the the Cardinals seem to have a little bit of a reckless abandon about them, um, the way they play. And ever since they lost Chandler Jones, who, um, you know, had 19 sacks last year, he's their their top pass rusher and one of the best players in the league. They've tried to figure out some exotic ways of manufacturing pressure. And what they do is they have a jet package where uh, they take defensive linemen off the field and they'll, they'll have uh, six or seven linebackers out there, and they'll all be around the line of scrimmage, all standing up, and you kind of have to play the guessing game as to who's coming and who's dropping, and they're very fast. Uh, their two, two linebackers are very quick. That's uh, Devondre Campbell, who's nursing a little bit of an ankle, uh, so we'll see if he's all right, and, and Jordan Hicks, who we're all familiar with, and, of course, Hassan Reddick, who's kind of coming into his own now as an edge rusher in that defense and not a middle linebacker. Uh, and, of course, the kid that they drafted out of uh, Clemson, Isaiah Simmons. They're, they're just very, very fast and athletic. So if you go back to last game and Jalen Hurts' ability to move the chains by running, there were times where Jalen just, you know, kind of dropped back, didn't see it, and ran to the edges. And he was able to outflank some of the some of the guys he was running against, like Demario Davis or Malcolm Jenkins. I don't know. This is a, very, a, a much quicker, faster athletic front, and uh, I don't know that Jalen's going to be able to just find running lanes and, and outrace guys to the sidelines the way he did last week. He's probably going to have to throw the ball more, um, and, and there'll be some opportunities to throw the ball deep because the, the Cardinals like to blitz, but they're also going to disguise a whole lot more than I think the Saints did. So this is going to be, you know, as you would expect, uh, your second start, you're going to see something new, you're going to see something different, and there's going to have to be a lot of processing going on for Jalen Hurts in this game. And, of course, the offensive line – has to deal with a different type of pass rush now. Speaking of throwing the football, how do you look at this whole situation with Alshon Jeffrey, with Doug Peterson saying, 
look, he's playing better than Fulgham, as if Alshon Jeffries lighting the world on fire. I just find it so weird that now he's getting less snaps than Quez Watkins. This whole situation is just getting so crazy. Do you, did you like the revisionist history by Doug? I think it was it was today or one of the press conferences Wednesday. where he said Alshon, I, I, Alshon Jeffries playing better, but wait a minute, he didn't catch that touchdown until after uh, the start, right? I mean, going into last week's game, he certainly wasn't playing better. I don't. Maybe he was having good practices, but nobody, you weren't seeing it on the field. And then he catches a little touchdown, and now all of a sudden he's. Uh, you know, the number well, one target, this, I guess. And this sounded, I think they're just making up. Yeah, this sounded to me, to though, Jeff, team. like to me, the way I read Peterson was he was essentially calling Fulgham out by saying he's not good enough. I mean, well, there, there's a reason why fair. this guy's bouncing all over the place. And, and, and we're seeing it in practice. But the problem is the fans are seeing production in a four game span and they're saying, mm-hmm. why not more? Well, that's definitely fair. I think the two things with Fulgham and John Hightower, who also lost snaps and didn't play. Uh, you know, he was an actor, right? So he didn't play at all yes. against the Saints. I mean, these guys are young kids, and I think you see this a lot with young kids where they've got some growing up to do. You know, they weren't getting the football a whole lot, and uh, you could tell by the body language, especially with, I think, Fulgham, that it just wasn't clicking with them, and uh, you can't bring that out onto the practice field Monday through Friday. Um, So uh, some of what I've heard is that those two guys have to kind of like improve a little bit in that area and mature a little bit. Uh, And that's so I do uh, insinuate Quez Watkins playing and Alshon Jeffrey playing as a little bit of a statement by the coaching staff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, Fulgham, this is pretty interesting. You know, I I actually just wrote a piece about Fulgham and I did some, you know, looking this up. He leads the team in receiving yards this year, and he's second in targets, and he's second in catches, and he's played less than 50% of the snaps. That's how good he was. So, Mm. you know, you you question to yourself, why was he so good, and how come he can't even be half of that? Because guess what? If he was half of what he was, he's still a pretty damn good player in this team. Yeah, there's certainly a disconnect going on there. And, uh, you know, if I were Fogelman, if I were Hightower, uh, I would have made it my priority this week in practice to do everything right because the opportunity should still be there for both of them. Uh, I saw, I believe I saw that Jalen Hurts was spending some time after practice with his receivers. Jalen Rager was also a part of that. This is a guy that they got to get the ball in his hands more, Jalen Rager. Yeah. Uh, three, three overall touches in each of the last two games. And every single time he's touched the ball in the last two games, in those six total touches, it's been a double-digit yard gain each time. Jeff, um, the offensive line is going to have another new look. It's the uh, 12th time in 13 or 13 and 14 or 14 and 15, whatever the heck it is. But you lose Driscoll. He's now gone. So what's this, the fourth or fifth different right tackle to start a game? I guess they're going to go back to Matt Pryor. But I guess the question would be, who's left? You know, if anybody else gets hurt, what is even left? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, the, I, I was very surprised that, the Eagles went out and signed a practice squad offensive lineman from Washington whose name is hard to pronounce. I think it's Ro- Ross Pierschbacker, if I if I got that correct. There you go. Um, instead of kind of looking for someone more veteran-like, like Jamon Brown. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but I, I did, I, I'm a little surprised because you're right. They're so young at backup right now. I mean, the next few guys that would have to be in would be like maybe uh, – We'll see if Prince Tega Winogo is active for this game. Luke Jariga is an undrafted free agent. Um, I'm trying to think who I'm missing among the uh, the offensive linemen. But, I mean, you already saw Suo Opeta playing this year, and he's out on IR. So, yeah, they're, they're thin. Brett, oh, Brett Toth, Poth, right? Brett Toth, that's another guy who, like, played against the Ravens. And I remember saying earlier that week that if you had to see Brett Toth in a game – that's trouble for the Eagles, and sure enough, he had to get in the game, and they lost. So they're really thin on the offensive line, and to be honest with you, as you're saying, not even great at some starting spots with with um, Matt Pryor now having to play right tackle, although I do think that's probably his best position of all the positions on the offensive line, but I'm sure that Carolina, I mean Arizona is just waiting to try to tee off on this offensive line. They do a lot of stunting. A lot of uh, I mentioned the blitzing, disguise blitzing, stunting, twisting. So they play a lot of line games. Those kind of teams have given the Eagles a lot of problems uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, Jeff, you talked about the offensive line and their issues. There was a game a couple of years ago 
that we all remember. Uh, Chandon, Sullivan, uh, Cravon, LeBlanc, Devontae, sure. Bosby. This secondary is going to be pretty similar to that. You've got guys. By the way, do you have any idea who Houston is? Um, Jameson Houston? Yeah. I mean, I know who he is only because the Eagles signed him a couple of weeks ago, but I didn't know who he was before he was uh, with the Eagles. So that's that's not a good thing for the Eagles, of course. Uh, I think the guy that, that, that we got to pay attention to is the other one that they picked up, um, Kevon Seymour, because he's played in the league a little bit. And, yeah, well, and they he's found gonna... him at the wheel and tire exchange uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, according <laughs> to. Uh... It wasn't true. <laughs> that is true. That's where they found him. I know. You can't make this up. It does feel like uh, that Saints game you were talking about where they had to play the law firm of uh, Bowsby Sullivan and uh, and uh, whoever the, the other guy LeBlanc. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it feels like that. Seymour has played a little bit. And again, this is more ammunition for the Cardinals to do what they do more than anybody, and that's put four wide receivers out there and make you match up with them with as many corners or safeties as possible. So it's it's going to be it's going to be a rough go. I mean the, the defensive line absolutely has to hit home and it's kind of hard to get home on a guy like Kyler Murray who runs around a lot. So they certainly have a big task ahead of them. Another part of this team that really needs to show up is the special teams. I mean Jake Elliott is a problem right now and the punt returning. I can't get over that. Why do you think and maybe it's the bobble that we saw when Jalen Rager ran it back, but why do you think they keep throwing Greg Ward back there? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, I you know, I think some of it is because they they may question Jalen's hands there, even though he dropped one and still returned it for a touchdown. Another thing is they're playing Jalen a lot of snaps in general, and so normally you look for a like a a fourth or a fifth receiver or corner or running or a backup running back to handle those roles. So they're probably reluctant to uh, have him, you know, pulling double duty as a return, a full-time returner and a full-time wide receiver. Not a lot of teams do that. Well, yeah, there. you've had so many injuries. I don't know that you want to put a guy out there to further your opportunity to get another guy hurt. And then there's part that part two. Uh, you know, Greg Ward, I assume, we'll see, but may see a fewer snaps now that, you know, Zach Ertz is entering week three. Of his, I mean, on his comeback, and you should see a lot of, tw- I would think, some 12 personnel out there, a decent amount with Goddard, Ertz, and then your two outside receivers will be, I guess, Alshon and, and Rager, or they'll mix in Quez Watkins. So Ward is a guy who's probably seeing fewer snaps now that Ertz has come back and, and is also your, your quote-unquote safe punt returner and that he's not going to put the ball on the carpet. By the way, uh, Slay looks like he, uh, he, he might play. He's questionable, but... This he's already had to go DK Metcalf. He's had to face Michael Thomas. I mean, he's had his hands full the last couple of weeks. This might be his uh, toughest battle yet up against uh, DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, I I would. It's certainly going to be a tough one. Hopkins only has five touchdowns. This is an interesting offense. You know, I watched a a decent amount of Cardinals tape this week. And um, the one thing that strikes me is, you know, for all the talk about air raid and you know, uh, and their offensive concepts. They're, they're more of a horizontal offense to me than a vertical one. They don't, they will take some shots. It's not like they don't do that. Uh, not, they're not thinking dunk, but a lot of their route concepts are those high low concepts and uh, mesh concepts and things that really look to exploit the middle of the field. And then, of course, Kyler runs around a lot. And so guys catch a lot of balls on the comebacks and um, the improv routes. So I do see there, if Zarius Slay can play, that's good. He's running around a lot. Uh, you hope that he can handle the over-the-top stuff and ready to go. But it's not something that I think the Cardinals do a whole lot to the point where, it, you know, you're really, like, worried about that deep strike. But, look, you got DeAndre Hopkins there, and they certainly can readjust their own offensive game plan to take more shots if they feel it's there. The question is, The question is this, right? They've got this kid, Andy Isabella, second-year receiver, and he can fly. But it seems like he's only been playing when Fitzgerald has been hurt. Well, now Fitzgerald is or not hurt or on COVID list. Now he's back. But Fitzgerald has killed the Eagles in the past. Like, abs- he has 54 catches against them in nine games. I mean, that's incredible. And he has, I think, ten touch- or eight or nine touchdowns in nine games. You, everybody, we know Larry Fitzgerald has killed the Eagles, but he's not the Larry Fitzgerald that he was of years ago. So I'll be curious to see if they get him out there on reputation or if they try to get a little bit more vertical 
against this beat up Eagles secondary and try to get Isabella on the field. Uh, he's Jeff Mosher. Don't forget the Inside the Birds pregame show with Mosh, Adam Kaplan, Greg Cosell, and Trey Thomas is on Facebook, Twitter, all your social media platforms at 10 a.m. They do it live. And, of course, uh, he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Jeff, give us a pick for the game. How's this one going to go? Yeah, you know, I was pretty good last week. I had 23-21 Eagles, and it wound up being 24-21. So we'll see if I'm on par again uh, this week. But I am taking the Cardinals in a kind of a shootout-type game. I – I have them winning. I wanted to say, I thought I had a 27-21. I forgot what I said on the pod already, but it was something in that in that vicinity. All right. Well, uh, Mosh, uh, I will not talk to you next week. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and all that good, that good jazz. good for you or me? No, I'm just kidding. Merry yeah, Christmas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk soon. I got a couple other ideas for you. All right. Sounds great. All right, pal. Take care. Jeff Bosher, everybody, here on the Boardwalk on the Hotline. 